Hi, and welcome to Campaign Legal Center's live event. Um, we are here today speaking with um, two amazing people that I have the pleasure of introducing. Um, I'm Simone Leeper, uh, host of Campaign Legal Center's Democracy Decoded podcast, and I'm here to introduce you to our speakers. So first, we're going to be speaking with someone that is obviously close to the Campaign Legal Center heart, uh, founder and president of Campaign Legal Center, Trevor Potter. Uh, Trevor is a former Republican chairman of the Federal Election Commission, and as I said, he's founder and president of Campaign Legal Center, which is the nonpartisan, nonprofit democracy group hosting this event today. Um, we are then very excited to be speaking with John Raitt, uh, who is a public policy expert with over 34 years of experience, and he is also an author, uh, most recently, of his book, Politics, Inc., America's Troubled Democracy and How to Fix It. So please welcome Trevor and John and take it away for a great conversation. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Simone. Great to be with you all. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that John Raitt is able to join us uh, today. He is uh, the author of Politics, Inc., America's Troubled Democracy and How to Fix It. I'm looking forward to our conversation, John, because uh, I'm really curious uh, what you think uh, is the source of the troubles we face today uh, as a democracy and as an election system, how we came to be so uh, divided, and what are the factors that you see that uh, make the problem worse? And then, of course, finally, what can we do to solve any of this? Uh, so it's a more than timely book. Uh, let me start by saying sort of why this book? Why Why now? What What uh, drove you to uh, write this? Well, thank you, Trevor, and uh, thank you, Simone, and thanks to the CLC for uh, hosting this event and for the work that you uh, do every day. I really appreciate it, uh, and great to speak with you and the audience today. Uh, I'd say three factors really inspired me to write this. Um, in, in, in the book, I talk about a trip that I took during the war in Iraq and uh, visited an outpost and uh, at the entry to the outpost uh, were pictures of all the young service members who'd been killed in the area um, and it looked like your typical high school or, or college uh, picture and i started thinking about the sacrifice these young people made and what they did in defense of democracy compared to how we were practicing at home and um, I started writing some about this issue and then January 6th happened and I realized it, it was time because frankly, I, I see the division and dysfunction in our democracy is, is uh, not just kind of one more wavelength in the sign curve that you know, the comings and goings here, but really is, it's become a national security issue. Um, adversaries look to use our freedom against freedom. Um, they have very sophisticated strategies to do that. We were warned about this by the founders uh, that over party partisanship and uh, parties would would be the undoing of democracy. And I think we're we're seeing some of that play out now. So I, I just felt very inspired uh, to do this. Yeah, certainly the the founders view was uh, that the problem with what they called factions, political parties, is that the adherents would put the party ahead of the country uh, or the party ahead even of the constituents they were supposed to be representing, that there would be this push to do things to aid the party, prevent the other party from getting into power, rather than focusing on you know, what the best solutions were to the issues we face. Uh, and, and that certainly seems in, in as if they had a crystal ball uh, because that feels like where we are now. Do you, do you think that's truer now than it was before? I mean, we've had parties for almost all of our political yeah, history. Right. No, I, I think that is true. And it's the old saying about the poison is in the dose. I think by virtue of technology, culture, money and politics, every, every problem that's been part of the system for a long time, structural problem, has just become exaggerated and the impacts are much greater. And, and, you talk about kind of the center point of the problem is I see the this party duopoly that sees advantage in fighting one another um, and that it, it's operating more like a, a duopoly, a business model. And 
uh, division is that business model. Um, and I think dysfunction is its product. Um, you see this translate from campaigns into uh, Congress and the ability, inability to address big problems that keep getting worse and worse and worse. So I think we, we really are, it's an overused term, but I really think we are at an inflection point. So you've called your book um, Politics Inc. What does that mean to you? What, why Politics Inc. and what, are we, what have you uh, found as you look at this? What, in terms well, of I, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think money sits at the center of, of this. Um, and as I say, division has become the, the business model. And as you look at the accelerating amount of money in each and every campaign, and the fact that that money is used for a growing percentage over a growing base amount of commercials that are basically very negative attack ads, um, and that this is working its way into the culture, our political culture, and and really impeding the ability to to work together, and and so I think that there's a business aspect to it, and it, it goes beyond just the parties and politics itself into the media. Uh, with a vast number of micro channels, um, you have a media that really needs to play to one particular audience, and everybody knows the issues of Fox and CNN and MSNBC. You don't need to repeat that here, but it's very true whether you're talking about online, whether you're talking about cable, you're talking about broadcast. It's become the business model really to be talking to a particular audience, and um, so I think technology plays a, a really key role here. I also think uh, culture and really the times do too. There's a lot about today that reminds me of the early 20th century with as the industrial revolution was moving forward where people had a uh, great concern about what their role in this new economy is. Um, the old ways were being overturned and uh, this was a great time for yellow journalism. It was a great uh, time for conspiracy theory. Uh, and so I think there are some parallels that are that are really situational as well. I mean, it strikes me that, that though one of the big differences which you outline in your book between now and, and say, 100, 110 years ago um, is w sort of where the money is. Uh, that back then, uh, the two national committees raised and spent money. Uh, today, we have this world of political consultants uh, who make a business of this. Uh, and their business model is to get wealthy by getting commissions uh, on uh, advertising uh, and obviously to win elections so that uh, they get hired by more candidates to, to do this. So you have that world, which has really grown as the amount of money spent in, in politics has, has skyrocketed. And then you have these outside spenders that it strikes me at least uh, don't have a parallel in U.S. politics. The, um, I can recall the first time I was asked by a reporter uh, what I thought about the, the, role, the role of the oligarchs, and that was 20 years ago. And I said, the oligarchs? I, I don't know a lot about what's going on in Russia. You should really ask someone else. And the German TV reporter said, no, no, I mean the American oligarch. <laughs> yeah. And that was the first time I'd heard that phrase. But if you look at what's happening this year and yesterday's uh, or Tuesday's primaries, you have billionaires funding candidates and spending tens of millions of dollars for their favored candidate through a super PAC they've created. Uh, and it, it seems to me that, that both of those are, are sort of fundamentally different than where we have been over the century with uh, the primary role in the past being really the political party rather than the consultants or the, the billionaires. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. Uh, and when you just look at the sheer amount of money, uh, and look, I think there are good people in political consultancy, there's good people across the board. I think that the system has just kind of overcome them and driving good people out of it, frankly. But but their job is not to forge consensus. Theirs is to create contrast. And they've got enormous resources and they've got enormous micro channels in, in order to apply that. And again, when you look at all the trends, all the good things you want to see uh, in a healthy democracy are steadily going down. And, th and this didn't start with Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi. Again, this is more structural. And these are 
pretty much longer term trends uh, and everything that you don't want to see uh, is is going up. So and I agree with you that we're basically in a money arms race and there's no no uh, end in sight. Um, and the more money is, the more uh, there's going to be a proclivity for negativity and division, because frankly, fear and distrust has always uh, separated people from their money and politics politicians, political consultants know that uh, quite well. So, um, yeah, a lot, lot to be concerned about. Yeah, it does seem to me that, that you're hitting on one of the, the key realities here, which is that um, from the politician standpoint and the consultants, uh, negativity and attack ads, wedge issues uh, are more effective. I mean, running a, an ad that has gauzy music and says that someone's a nice person uh, is fine, but less effective than an attack ad that tears up the other uh, candidate. So there's an incentive to run uh, those those negative ads from the, the candidate right. side. Well, and you know, as we're talking about the structural issues, uh, one of the reasons that really the fundamental uh, calculus in elected politics has changed. It used to be that you would try to out be, beat the other guy by getting more of the political center. And that's completely changed now as a result of gerrymandering and other structural uh, defects, I think, um, is people have to play to their base. That, again, reinforces uh, the negativity. Um, and then by the time they get to Congress, they're they're representing. When you look at the spreads between Republicans and Democrats in various districts, it's only increasing. You know what political calculus? Once you get to Congress, suggests you should work with the other side. Uh, there's a problem solvers con caucus in Congress, which humored me because it's got 54 members at least last count. I I actually thought that's what uh, the entire membership was supposed to be of Congress for problem solvers. But when you look at where they're from, their districts they're from, very narrow gap between Republicans and Democrats. And I think that tells us uh, something. And again, that issue cascades down, not just through elective politics, but in policy makings and really the political culture. And of course, the fear of members of Congress is that if they actually become problem solvers, which means voting for bipartisan legislation, uh, voting for something that that their own base may not like, uh, that that they then will lose a primary. And we saw this year people who voted for the infrastructure bill, which was a bipartisan bill supported by the leadership in both houses, then being defeated, uh, perhaps because they were attacked for those for vote for those votes for voting with the other party. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Well, those people used to be called statesmen. Uh, now they're called traitors and and uh, really the marginalization marginalization of what i call the rational center which is the construction zone of, of functional democracy has cratered and again i go back to gerrymandering and, and other structural things that that really reinforce that um and so you're right uh, compromise is now considered a sin um anyway well let's talk about gerrymandering you mentioned that um uh, some states have come up with independent commissions, uh, which is to say the citizens have pushed for that and forced it on usually reluctant legislatures. Uh, but that only can be done in states that allow direct citizen initiatives or amendments to their constitution by the voters. Uh, that's hard. And, and there are a number of states where in order to change that, you actually need the legislature to do it. Um, You've seen what's been happening this year across the country. Uh, I would characterize it as saying generally the states that have independent commissions have produced pretty fair maps. Uh, of course, CLC has been part of that push across the country to get independent commissions. We've defended them in court. But there are a lot of states that don't have those and uh, don't have a mechanism under state law to challenge gerrymanders. What do we do about that? Yeah, I mean... Uh I think if I go back to my original point is that we're, we're not, this is now a national security issue and we're going to have to penetrate the patriotism of elected officials and state legislatures where those mechanisms don't exist to let them know really the health of our democracy, our prosperity and security rests on getting this right. 
And and when you look at as a partisan uh, gerrymandering, um, I would also call uh, elected you know, secretaries of state and the chief election officer in various states when they uh, have an R or a D by their name and, and party allegiances. That just enhances the distrust um, that is uh, pandemic uh, in our system. Nobody trusts anywhere, and partly that's that's how a market and don't trust the other person there. You know, when you even with Trevor, look at the language we use now. When I when I was working on the Hill years ago, you know, it, you never heard the word liar or traitor that type of thing. Now you hear it all the time, and it, it's these norms are passing away. Uh, and again, unless unless we fix this, uh, we're in deep trouble. And I think somehow that that sense of patriotism has to penetrate, and it needs a citizen movement. I say in the end of the book that I have the four C's here of a, a, a better political competition of making our, our, our elections about ideas rather than money, new modes of collaboration, which we absolutely must have. Uh, and I get down to the content of what we, uh, what we take in is political information and content, which I hopefully we'll talk a little bit, but then a citizen's movement. Um, you know, if, Good thing about democracy is that it is uh, responsive to public opinion, and it's a matter of generating better and stronger public opinion that this needs to change. So you you mentioned the you know the role of elected secretaries of state and other elected officials and the risk there of the partisan identification, which is traditionally uh, how things have happened in this country because offices uh, are elected are elected and they tend to, to be party nominees. You you know the world, you've spent a lot of time in the national security field. What's the alternative? How do other countries uh, avoid partisanship in the running of their elections? Yeah, I haven't, uh, it's a good question. I haven't really studied the comparative to uh, other countries. I just think that there is an opportunity to make it a, a, a non-elected um, post. Uh, I, th I think there are mechanisms that we can can use to just take away the partisan identity of people. Um, I, you know, I, I find what I try to do is consult with certain states, you know, because I got back to gerrymandering. I think there are some leaders that are really doing important things. The governor of North Carolina and governor of uh, Maryland um, have pledged to work together. So uh, I, I think there's some solutions out there, but I haven't, I haven't really spent much time studying how other countries handle it. Well, I mean, I guess part of it is leaders can only lead if they have followers. O otherwise, you're not a leader. You're, you're a voice in the wilderness. And um, so, you know, you mentioned the possibility of, of having secretaries of state be appointed rather than elected. Um, that, of course, depends on who's doing the appointment. Uh, everyone woke up uh, after Tuesday's primary in Pennsylvania to discover that uh, the Republican nominee for governor uh, is a believer in the Trump big lie theory uh, and has been attacking the way elections are run, attacking absentee ballots. Well, it turns out that Pennsylvania is one of those states where the governor gets to appoint the secretary of state. Right. Uh, so uh, what looked like a way to keep that office out of partisanship uh, now has the possibility of, of uh, having a very partisan appointee. Yeah, it's That's true, but the, there there would be no problem or no reason you couldn't have and should have state statute identifying what are the qualifications uh, of that appointee. Um, and, and that, I think, could address that issue. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that makes sense. And, and my experience uh, doing some international election observing is that we very much go uh, abroad to other countries and say, uh, do as we say, not as we do, because we tell other countries that they should have a nonpartisan system, that the political parties shouldn't be involved in counting the votes and determining how to vote and so forth, that that all ought to be separate from partisan politics. And then that's not how we do it at the moment. Yeah, I, I, that cuts across a lot of ways. I, I, you know, we have a national endowment of democracy and it's four constituent agencies that spend a lot of time and money, do great work all around the world. And, uh, you know, they, uh, I look at what they say about those things in, in debates. In fact, the Presidential Commission on Debates has an international arm that helps people. I don't know one country 
that would like to look at our debates and say that that's what we want. And again, the party duopoly for most part controls what those look like and how they're operated. And I, I find that to be absolutely the wrong way to go. Um, debates, whether you like them or not, are really one of the primary means by which the public assesses candidates. And the fact that the candidates themselves, the parties have control of, of who, what, where, when, how, and why uh, makes no sense to me. Um, but like I say, you know, we go abroad and say, do this, do that, and the other thing. And in some instances, they they say, well, uh, practice what you preach. I, you know, back on the national security theme, again, I think a real canary in the coal mine is look at the country of Africa, which is going to have a lot to do with stability or instability in the 21st century. And one of their uh, top leaders is uh, President Kagame of Rwanda. And a couple of years ago, he was asked about what models they're looking to. And he said, well, we used to look to West, the United States and NATO countries. And um, now we're looking elsewhere for models and leadership. So um, we're spoiling the, br the brand. And that's, again, going to have long term implications for us. Well, and you mentioned the presidential debates as, as and, and you say that uh, I think accurately that the Presidential Commission on Debates is a is a two-party duopoly. Part of their role has been to keep out third-party candidates from those debates, their lawsuits over that, et cetera. But as you know, recently the Republican National Committee announced that it opposed uh, having the Presidential uh, Commission sponsor debates and that they actually uh, would require Republican nominees not to participate. Uh, are, are debates something that, that are important at this stage to our democracy? And if so, how do we make them either less partisan or make sure they occur? Because what, what we're, we're seeing happen is a challenge to the very idea that there should be uh, a debate with an even uh, playing field for voters yeah. to look at. Yeah, I mean, I think most the public believes debates are, are important. It's the first time you can see candidates face to face answering the same questions. Uh, again, it's in, in the book and some people might disagree with it, but I, I frankly think uh, it should be a matter of statute um, and, and structured. So if you're running for an office, you need to participate in these forums and here's how they're structured and let's get rid of uh, the debates being monitored or moderated by uh, you know, uh, a, a star press person who's trying to make some news on their own by how they handle the debate rather than ask, you know, important questions and have a series over the big issues uh, that matter to people in their lives. I, again, I just reject the notion that the extent debates are important, that they're controlled by by the parties in this, what the Republican Party do is to be a step in the wrong direction so they can control uh, rather than, you know, a third a third party. So uh, we've talked about the, the role that consultants play in creating the divisive world we're in uh, and the gerrymandering. But what about the, the press? I mean, I, I look at this and say the world as we know it has changed dramatically over the last couple decades. You yeah. used to have three networks and you could pick between them, but there really were three. And they were, I think you'd say, centrist. Uh, now you have the business models on, on both sides, both partisan sides, Fox's model and, say, MSNBC's, which are uh, to create anger and divisiveness because that's what gets them their niche of viewers. Yeah. How, how, how do we, we can see the damage that does. We've got a First Amendment. Uh, the government can't say you can't do that. The FCC uh, has removed uh, the fairness doctrine, which said you had to cover both sides and give them both equal time. So how do we handle uh, the, the increased siloization of the way Americans get their, their news? Yeah, I think, well, part it's citizen education. I just go back on media. There, there's only one industry that's mentioned in the Constitution, and that's the press. So we understood how important uh, a press is to self-government and forming the public. And um, I agree with you that, uh, regarding we used to have three networks. So there was this common frame of reference um, and there's no going back. People aren't going to limit themselves. I, and, and I don't believe that 
you know, any type of government control or censorship is the right way to go. That sends us in the opposite direction. Um, I, I do think there are some things we can and should do, um, such as better labeling of what's opinion, what's analysis, and what's news. A lot of people tune in these days, believe they're watching the news. They're not. They're watching opinion. So I, I think... Or, uh, or entertainment, which is what yeah. the, the, many of those talk show hosts actually yeah, say. Exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a circus. And uh, again, generates uh, uh, ad revenue. I mean, look at what Donald Trump did for CNN and the cable. It was a, a financial windfall for them. So, uh, and it's not lost on the uh, on the networks. In fact, Les Moonves at CBS said uh, super PACs might be bad for politics and democracy, but they're good for CBS. <laughs> so that, that gives you an indication of, of, of their view of it. Um, so yeah, I think I think citizen education. I think labeling absolutely is critical. You know, and it, it was uh, interesting. I commend this for, to people to read it, it. It shows you that these issues have been this for a while. And again, it's just the intensity of them, the, the poison and the dose is uh, right the break out of World War II, they started the Loose Commission, which was started by the head of founder of Time Magazine uh, to get the industry together to what is the role of the press in a democracy uh, as we were, you know, existentially threatened by, by fascism. And uh, they came out with a number of recommendations and things, and you could read that off today. Um, so whether whether we need a, a new loose commission or not, I don't know. But I just I found that interesting that uh, they were grappling grappling with these same issues uh, in World War II, and of course now we we have a new threat of autocracy on the rise. By the way, I meant to mention you know we're now gone our fifteenth year in a row of the decline of democracy globally. Um, again, one more canary in the coal mine. Um, based on the the rating of countries that are 100% democracies or only partial democracies, I take it that's that's what you're referring to, John. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Freedom House has some really good reporting reporting on that. You said earlier in our conversation that there were a number of indicia that uh, our democracy was uh, diminishing un under threat uh, had uh, ha was having problems. What what are those in in this show? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you uh, both on the trends of steadily down, and then those that are steadily up from from the, the negative standpoint. Steadily down, trust in government. Seventy five percent of people don't trust government. Uh, three quarters did if you go back to nineteen sixty. Trust in the media has, has gone down over a long time trend. Bipartisan bills in Congress and uh, even intermingling on the floor have gone down. I think it was a university in Iowa uh, watched films, uh, C-SPAN films of the House and Senate floor and found over a period of time, even physical interaction across the aisle was steadily declining, which I thought was really interesting. Again, going down the number of swings, swing districts uh, that are more likely to elect centrists. Uh, trust in the honesty of elections, that goes without saying. And again, as I mentioned, 15 years of decline in democracy worldwide. Uh, things that are steadily going up um, is animosity for the other part. We, you know, Paul, democracy is meant to be a fierce competition, but it's got to be fair and it's got to be functional if it's to survive. And we have now seen you know, hate really creep into our political culture like never before. Uh, that's up. As I said, negative ads, a steady decline. Back when Kennedy was running, 10% uh, of the ads that were run in that campaign uh, were considered negative. Today, uh, 70%. Again, the cost of campaigns. Um, when you look at the 1980 uh, Carter Reagan, it was 200 million. 2020, it was. Five billion, probably it's probably been adjusted upwards. I, I don't know. Um, the length of campaigns continuing to get longer and longer and longer. Again, with more money, more time to campaign, more negativity. Again, another poison in the political uh, culture. And then um, the growth of out of district contribu contributions. Um, uh, I'd like to come back to that because I think that's that's really an important one. Um, and then the number of landslide victories uh, has been going up. And then again. The, the 
dysfunction in Congress, the number of cloture votes to cut off debates, the number of filibusters, the inability uh, on the downside to be able to pass the regular order of appropriations bills and budget bills, um, which means our policies and laws can't really keep up with a fast changing world. You know, all those are really, really poor signs that scream for uh, reform and modernization. That's a long and pretty depressing list. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Well, we have a we have a way of rising to the occasion, and I like I, I think that we we actually do. I just going back on the money thing when you consider that members themselves say that 40 percent of their time in the house is spent fundraising, which is time away from working with constituents, time away from working with colleagues to address problems. And as the amount of money needed to run and win it grows, I, I suppose that 40% will continue to, to grow. Uh, and again, those structures really affecting directly the ability of Congress to function. And of course, then that has downstream cascading effects because Congress has uh, really hurt itself and now more and more power flows to the executive branch because because of the dysfunction in Congress, which then becomes another point of partisan warfare. Yes, and, and then those times we've had and will have in the future, the executive branch in one party and both houses of Congress in the other, uh, it makes it very difficult to function because you have all these incentives to battle uh, the, the other side rather than do uh, try to come up with some compromises. Yeah. And compromise right. becomes a dirty word. Uh, I, we've talked about money in, in politics a lot, um, but I know your book also has a chapter on our voting laws and uh, systems uh, and, and the attempts to create barriers to vote or to uh, gain partisan advantage through the way the rules are are structured. Um, and, and that obviously goes to the division you're talking about, but it's not a money issue. So tell us a little bit about that. What what are you seeing and what are your concerns with that? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to the duopoly aspect of, of the system uh, is that each side is going to pursue what, what will give them the greatest advantage of the uh, uh, at the voting booth. Um, and so in terms of, look, voting security is very important. Voting participation is very important. I think two parties that were looking out for the national interest could figure out how to reconcile those rather than pursuing what they think would most advantage uh, their their group at the, at the booth. Um, so I think it's a, a perfect example of that. And really, it, that goes to getting on ballots, uh, restrictive, so you don't let uh, other parties get on the ballots, um, sore loser laws, uh, that type of thing, closed primary elections, uh, and then going back to, to gerrymandering. Um, all, all those are part of their pursuit of their, their party interests rather than what's really healthy for democracy. I, I think all of that is on display in, in what we're seeing. I guess the question is, what do we do about that? Uh, and and you know, let me just for a moment outline the context here, which is uh, after the Civil War, uh, Congress used, uh, for, first of all, uh, Congress and the states passed amendments to the Constitution to ensure that the Constitution said that persons born in the states were citizens, and specifically then uh, that citizens then just male citizens, but since amended to men and women citizens could uh, not be discriminated against uh, in, in terms of the ability to vote. And then Congress has passed both uh, back then in the reconstruction period after the war and then more recently in the 1960s, Congress has passed legislation to enforce that. And as you know, under the constitution, uh, states run elections unless Congress intervenes and establishes rules, which it has the power to do for federal elections. Uh, but recent attempts to have Congress step in and establish rules to make sure that 
the election laws are fair and don't discriminate against uh, voters of one party or per, uh, voters of a particular uh, uh, color. Those attempts have gotten nowhere because of the structure of Congress, meaning they passed the House, uh, they could have passed the Senate in an up or down vote, uh, but the Senate filibuster rules meant there was no up or down vote. You need 60 votes in the Senate uh, to bring something to the floor over objections. So how is it that we are going to be able to deal with the challenges you're describing to voting rights in a situation where the majority in Congress is unable to enact legislation because of the Senate rules and the courts uh, with the, the new very conservative majority on the Supreme Court seem disinclined uh, or opposed to federal uh, intervention to tell states how to be fair. So in right. that situation, where do we go? What do we do? Yeah, and, and I would make point out that the National Association of Secretaries of State, I believe that's the name of it, are very opposed to uh, Congress getting involved. That's that's their bailiwick, and they don't want any uh, involvement in that, which uh, adds to the complication. But you, again, pointed back uh, to the structural issue that makes it harder for Congress to do that. And that, again, is is gerrymandering that, that creates um, a membership uh, of a particular approach to these things that aren't helpful to that. So I think, again, going back to that, and I go back to this is going to require the, the biggest uh, impetus for action in a democracy, and that's public, uh, public opinion. Um, and until until people start demanding this, um, it's it's not going to happen because it'll be rest in the hands of the parties who will pursue their objectives. Uh, so so that does you know lead us wondering uh, where we go on this. Your book is a clarion call saying that where we're headed as a democracy is going to weaken us as a country and implicitly. Um, uh, ready to, uh, you know, weaken us internationally. Um, but how do we get that message out? You're doing a good job with, with the book, but how do we get our, our leaders to tell all the players you're talking about, uh, the consultants and the uh, partisan uh, commentators and so forth, that, they're, that they need to pay attention to the damage they're doing and get them to listen. How do we do that? Yeah. Well, I, I think the national security community needs to be more vocal. There's a part of my book about a speech that the uh, chief of staff, the armed forces of Russia gave a few years ago, uh, a guy named Valery Gerasimov, who talked about uh, what they call control chaos, hybrid warfare of trying to weaken the United States from inside, use freedom to weaken freedom. Uh, and I imagine, um, you know, it, it's a blueprint for exactly what's going on to weaken trust in the media, to weaken trust in one another and and try to take us down from the the inside. So um, I think I think the national security community needs to uh, get more involved in, in blowing the whistle on this. Um, I'll go back to I think there are ways we can do uh, creative approaches. The same thing that you said about, you know, voting rights, I think, is the same thing with the role of money, as long as this particular court uh, views through Buckley uh, in Citizens United um, that the equality of speech uh, and uh, and money, um, where does that leave us at overturning uh, the ability to create and, and uh, operate super PACs? Well, I have I have a thought that's stated the book, and I'm, there'll probably be some constitutional lawyers who start doing spins at it. Um, but I, it's almost accepting the premise that of speech and money is synonymous. And if that's true, and considering that something like 75% of House uh, seats, the member receives more money from outside their district than from people who can vote for them. And same to a certain degree uh, in the Senate, large, large amounts of that money from out of state. If, if that's true, did the founders really expect elected officials to listen to more to people who couldn't vote for them, their speech, than those who can? I, I would say not. And so I think to me, um, that would be a very interesting way to go is accept the premise of equality of, uh, of speech and, um, and money and, and base reform on that. I think if you did that, 
the amount of money of campaigns, I believe, would go down significantly. The amount of time members would have to spend raising money would go down uh, precipitously and and help quite a bit. So I think I think we have to get creative here as well, as well as a back on the money thing, of of really hyping what some of the states have done uh, that is really working. You know, not allowing um, fundraising while their legislatures in se session. I think that would be a really good idea for yeah. Congress. Not allowing, you know, uh, lobbyists to uh, also be chief fundraisers, that type of thing. Um, so I think we just have to get creative and follow some of the states that are working and really bang the drum using the national security community. Those are those are great suggestions. It's nice to think there are some things that could be done, whether there's the political will and the bipartisan consensus to accomplish them. I, I don't know. Um, it used to be that uh, when election bills came through the House and Senate, they were bipartisan. They were negotiated uh, by party leaders. But now you have no such negotiation. So the majority party in whichever chamber either pushes their bill through or refuses to consider anything. Uh, and so you have this deadlock. Congress hasn't enacted yeah. a discussion in this area in quite a while. I had a, a U.S. Senator say something very interesting to me. We're talking about uh, the demise of the regular order, where members, duly elected members, can go down and, um, and amend bills, offer their amendments, vote, participate in the legislative process. And of course, over time, for all the reasons we've been discussing, that power has now been pulled in mainly to the leader's office and a couple of you know, chairman, and they write a bill that's a fait accompli, it gets put on your desk, and then cloture is filed to cut off debate, and you have to either vote up or down. We we're talking about this. It's very frustrating for people who came came to Washington, represent their constituents, and be part of, of solutions. And the, the member told me, he said, you know, when you have the demise of regular, there's nothing left but partisanship. I thought that was a really interesting statement and really, really true. So I think we have a few questions, uh, John, from our audience, and uh, uh, we'll pop them up on the screen. So we can look at this one together. Uh, money in politics is a growing point for a constitutional amendment, which would enable uh, Congress to limit political spending and differentiate between the individuals and, and corporations and other legal entities as donors. Um, what do you make of that? Is that a way to convince Politics Inc. to disarm? You know, I don't think, I'm not sure anything will convince them to disarm um, because there, there's too many people vested in in, uh, in the process. Again, I, I hate to say this because people probably roll their eyes, but it really goes back uh, to a citizen movement to compel this. Um, you know, I, I, I agree there's lots of limits that you could put on, but they all require elected officials that come from one of the two parties. By the way, there are more independents in this country now than there are either Republicans or Democrats, which, you know, given the uh, power and influence of, of the duopoly, I find also ironic and, and dysfunctional. Um, but I think that's the only way we're going to get get the, the reforms necessary. And, and Trevor, you're... You're a far greater expert than I on, on campaign finance and finance reform. I'd, I'd probably be more interested in your answer. Well, I was, I was thinking, I mean, looking at this question, um, the, the, as you know, uh, we've got a couple problems with changing the current Politics Inc. system. One, as we've been discussing, is getting Congress to agree to do that. And that clearly takes a citizen push. But the other problem is, even if Congress were to do it, uh, having the Supreme Court strike down whatever Congress has done uh, as unconstitutional in some way violating freedom of speech. We just saw that this week where the Supreme Court uh, overturned a provision that's been in effect for 20 years under McCain-Feingold that limited how much candidates could repay themselves after the election because what we were seeing is candidates would loan themselves money not give it which they're entitled to do says the court without limit but loan themselves money and then if they won the election they would go out and fundraise from large donors and put the money back in their pocket which was as direct a payment 
by donors to candidates as you could have. Uh, they knew if you had a PAC fundraiser in Washington to quote retire debt, that the debt was the candidates and they were going to put that money in their pocket. Uh, so to prevent what uh, Congress saw as a real potential for corruption here, it limited the amount that could be repaid after the election to $250,000, which is not a yeah. small lump. Yeah. But this was challenged by Ted Cruz, who deliberately lent his campaign just a little over 250. He could have given it, but he didn't, to create a constitutional challenge. And indeed, the court, six conservatives said, oh, no, this violates the First Amendment because it might dissuade a candidate from financing themselves. And that's a protected constitutional right. And then they said, and there's no countervailing government interest because there's no evidence of corruption or the potential for corruption here. Although yeah. the whole theory was to prevent corruption. Right. So I raise all of that because that's an example of Congress actually getting its act together and saying we want to reform the system. And then the court stepping in, which it has been doing frequently in these last years, to get rid of the combined contribution limit in Citizens United to allow corporate spending. Uh, so in a number of cases, the court has struck down what Congress has passed. So yep. this question here from Marie HK is, what about changing the Constitution, having a constitutional amendment that would allow Congress to limit spending and to differentiate between these? In other words, if Congress could get its act together to pass legislation, the Constitution would be amended so that the court wouldn't throw that legislation out. Now, isn't that push for a constitutional amendment one way for citizens to do what you're describing, to, uh, to uh, pull together a national movement and push and tell their legislators that they want to change the way we're doing business? Yeah, certainly. And we know we know how hard it is to amend the Constitution. So one could have a debate whether it's more likely you could compel Congress to act versus amending the Constitution itself. Uh, but again, that would be a rallying point for the type of citizen activism that we've been talking about, because you could lay out very precisely why this is uh, so critical to democracy and, and uh, you know, it might take a while, but it's certainly worth, worth trying to do. I, I wanna go back, uh, Trevor, to your point. Um, and I know CLC did some really excellent work uh, with on the case of a guy named Lev Parnas, who had given uh, uh, Trump super PAC money and uh, were able to ferret out that this was done through a shell through, through a shell company and uh, creating all kinds of problems. But this whole myth that somehow members of Congress said it, it's not something to be concerned about uh, because there's no coordination between the super PAC and the member receiving the benefits of their activities, which I think McCain and others have said was, was the most laughable lie in Washington. And I go back to this case of Lev, who then went to a big dinner at the Trump Hotel that the president was involved with, knowing everybody who gave to the super PAC. And then they had a conversation on the side regarding uh, conditions in Ukraine and getting rid of the ambassador. So this whole notion that it, with all due respect to the Supreme Court, that there aren't uh, issues involved with corruption um, I just are, are baldly false. Well, it's pretty remarkable that here you have this central uh, issue in the impeachment trial, the removal of the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine uh, for domestic reasons. And it partially came about because somebody bought access uh, they got a dinner with the president uh, by promising a million dollars to the super PAC. Yeah. Uh, and how that's not coordination, I don't you know, understand how that's the case. So it go back to your point of how the Supreme Court views these things. So, mm -hmm. no, I think that's a very good point. The, the, the court seems to have blinders on about the danger of corruption. And the chief justice himself says there's nothing corrupt about uh, buying access, about selling uh, influence and the ability to meet uh, with members of Congress, because that's how our system is designed to work, uh, which I think would have been news to the founders. But yeah. um, 
All right, let's see if we have another question out there. Um, I think it's coming up. Ah, yes, ranked choice voting. Yeah. What do you make? What do you make of that? Um, how does it fit into what you're looking for? Yeah, I'm a I'm I'm a big fan of that, and it's um, support for that's registered in the book because I think if you're going to you know break the party duopoly, expanding ballot access, uh, providing fusion voting so more people feel like they can find a political home while still being uh, relevant, and rank cho choice voting um, is really important. One among other things, just establishing true majorities. I mean, I have to you have to almost laugh that. I don't know how many presidents they have it in the book uh, over the last five or six, one with pluralities rather than majorities, and then immediately come back and, and declare that they have this big mandate for change. I would think a plurality gives you a mandate to try to work with the other side, uh, but that that doesn't seem to happen. So, uh, again, I, I think uh, ranked choice voting is a good a good way to bring more people and find a, a political home and make sure that we have uh, a true true majorities. And of course, there are states that that are doing ranked choice voting. Some some of them uh, combining it as Alaska has done uh, with a top five uh, pro open primary system, so that you don't. I mean, the, one of the issues we've talked about is the partisanship in the party bases that gives you two candidates, one extreme right, one extreme left representing a very small percentage of the total electorate. And so it ranked choice voting gives you a chance to vote between potentially two polarized uh, candidates uh, with with maybe a, the point is an independent or, or more than one uh, in the mix. But if you have open primaries, then uh, you may end up with a, a range of candidates in that general election whom you're then ranking. Uh, and it, it, the theory is, could diminish the partisanship. Um, yeah, yeah. Is your view that that's worth a, a shot? I, I do. And people say, well, you know, there's warts. So of course there's warts, but look at our, our current system. So yeah, I, I think for those strategic reasons of giving people a political home, driving true majorities, I think it's uh, in, in diffusing, you know, uh, the duopoly a little bit. I think, I think those are important um, ends. Makes sense. Uh, do we have another question? I think we might have uh, one more. There we go. Well, that's a good one. To, uh, uh, what could get the grassroots up in arms uh, for change? Uh, how, how do we find effective leadership uh, to, to do this in the current yeah. system we've got? So um, here's an interesting thing. Back uh, back in the 80s, I think it was, something like 75, 80% of the Senate had served in the military. And I think coming to, to the Senate, coming to Congress with that experience uh, made a difference in their willingness to uh, really highlight and prioritize national interests that time. Well, not to say that things weren't partisan, of course they were but they were more functional and they I think they were fair and uh, worked better. But um, that's obviously gone down, 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 down. Um, I think where we are now is that is going to start going back as veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan start taking their place in Congress. I think I think, again, going back to my comment about getting the national security uh, sector involved in this um, is one way to do that within Congress is love to see a caucus of former military members uh, take this on as an issue, highlight the national security implications, uh, and really motivate that uh, grassroots effort uh, for change. Because it does, it does have to take place both at the state level, state legislatures, and at the national level. That, that um, is encouraging that you think that you could see some sort of a bipartisan consensus uh, emerging because of that different experience and the national security focus, which is obviously your background and the reason for writing this. We, we are coming close to the end of our time. So let me ask you a final question, John, which is if you could leave your audience with one thought today, um, what is that? Now, feel free to make that uh, two thoughts if you want, but 
uh, what is it that you want everyone uh, participating in this conversation to come away from it with? Well, our future is at stake. It is a national security issue. I'm going to I'm going to give you five points real quick. We need to restore the sensible center. We we have empowered the extremes to our detriment, and a lot of things we've talked about today would help restore the center. We need to break the party duopoly. We talked about um, some of these things like ranked choice voting. Um, I think we need a Goldwater Nichols for government. Goldwater Nichols is what got the military services working together towards nat towards missions rather than operating in their stovepipes. Uh, we we really need that sense of cohesion and, and mission focus. Uh, uh, Goldwater Nichols for the civilian branches of government. Uh, we need to right the role of money. I think keep testing Citizens United. Uh, this whole issue of maybe only in state and in district contributors. Uh, some of these other things we've talked about. And then a national command on civics liber literacy. The good thing about democracy is the, the public gets the government they deserve. Um, and um, I think we have to go on a major civics literacy campaign, which will also uh, help inform people of how to receive and digest political information that we talked about earlier. Well, thank you, John Wright, for uh, having this conversation with Campaign Legal Center today. Thank you for writing this book. Uh, I know uh, that's not an easy task, uh, but you've given us all a lot to, to chew on. So the, the book, Politics, Inc., uh, is available uh, at all the usual booksellers. Barnes & Noble has it. Amazon has it. With luck, your corner bookstore has it. Uh, so uh, I would encourage everyone on this call to go out, find a copy, learn more about uh, what John has been talking about today. Uh, there couldn't be a more important subject for the future of this country than how our democracy works and how to fix it. So John, thank you for uh, your time with us today and, and for your thoughts in the book. Trevor, thank you. And again, thanks to CLC.